that I try to do going forward is encourage a diversity of thoughts. And if everybody's thinking the same thing, try to find someone who's not thinking the same thing because that'll actually help increase both the cognitive diversity of the organization and of the group, but also make sure that we're prepared and looking at things from all angles should a bad day happen. During the eGov initiative, if we hadn't had those, how many, 100 people? 100 people. 100 people uh, narrowing down to 24 eGov initiatives and the diversity of thinking was essential in the way we approach things. And without that, I don't think we would have gotten very far. I mean, the traditional thinking was only going to give you the traditional answer. So uh, I, think, I think that was the genius of putting it together in that form. As a leader, you have to be very cautious about making sure your organization does not fall into the trap of thinking the future is gonna be like the past, only slightly different. And you need to help them sort of expand their aperture and say, okay, well, this is what might happen, but what else might happen that we're not thinking about yet? Tony Summerlin, how do you reconcile the demand for stability on the one hand with the need and the desire for disruptive change on the other hand? People are very comfortable doing what they're doing. And in government, just like in most places, you get rewarded for things running the way they're supposed to run and you don't have the time to look at different ways of doing it. So if you have a fall guy that says, okay, we're gonna stop doing it that way, we're gonna do it this way, and someone has someone to blame it on, or that, that's usually me. Well, of course, there, there is that old saying that says, no good deed shall go unpunished. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was gonna say that you're hitting the nail on the head, um, Michael, with the fact that if you wanna encourage resiliency, you really have to encourage a change in the incentives. And as Tony was pointing out, there's really no reward for taking risk in public service. And that's, that's okay. That just means that those of us that wanna do it, wanna do it for something other than some tangible reward. We wanna do it to try and actually make a positive difference to the world or the nation. When you look at public service and you look at what is the motivator and how to create an environment where disruption is appreciated, because you're talking about like, how do I bring in new technology? How do I integrate new processes? How do I change things? And that, that reward is in the long run, you may not necessarily be uh, rewarded in the short run, but in the long run, you're rewarded because I look now and I see a lot of the things that we were pushing really hard for that I have my butt handed to me more times than who knows what, but the nation is doing it now. One, there's the long-term impact that you do get to see 10 to 15 years later, things that you worked on and pushed through to get done. But then two, it is a responsibility of any good leader to try and actually push things forward. Um, so I think both what Karen tried to do when she was in her role as federal CIO, uh, my role as FCC CIO, is make sure at least for those people that are on your team, you are rewarding them, even if the larger ecosystem hasn't taken that on. What's the relation between cloud and resiliency and any, any other perspectives you have on, on the cloud? The first thing that started this was data center consolidation, which Karen um, uh, wrote up before the end of the last administration. If you're not gonna move the data center or consolidate data centers, then at least take a look at the applications you have. And if they can be modified in a way that they can be in a cloud environment, they should be there. Why? because ultimate resiliency rely, lies in the cloud. When people say, well, I, want, I don't know that the cloud is safe, these people are businesses. They stay in business by staying operational. If there's anyone that's going to keep a center running, it's someone that has a cloud. So it, I think the entire argument about cybersecurity and resiliency mm -hmm. is ludicrous. Um, Comparing a data center to a true cloud environment, another form of data center, but a true cloud environment where you're slicing and dicing applications and you're slicing and dicing space and storage is so much more resilient than anything any agency could afford, even DOD. I mean, people cannot afford it. And as uh, David has pointed out many times on cybersecurity is the ultimate reason we can't afford as a small place, the commission can't buy all the tools necessary to be cyber secure, but 
cloud infrastructures provide a level of security that otherwise is unavailable. And people provide pipes to the cloud that are absolutely secure. So I think the argument about whether or not to go to cloud is silly and buying applications that are born and bred in the cloud that are just SaaS applications is the way to go. And if you're building platforms, you have Azure, SoftLayer, mm -hmm. AWS, you have platforms that are cloud-based to build them on, and you have ultimate resiliency in those environments with access from anywhere. So it supports working from home, it supports BYOB, it supports whatever other functions you want not to be at the office in downtown DC or somewhere else. So I want to bring it back a little, uh, I'm going to bring it back to 9-11 and then fast forward to cloud. So on when 9-11 and all of this stuff happened, there was one news service that actually stayed up through the whole thing, which was CNN. So we wanted to find out who was actually hosting and provisioning CNN. And it turned out it was Mark Andreessen, okay? Mark Andreessen's new company. And he always wanted to talk to me. So he wanted me to buy provision services. So if you think about this, this is 15 years ago. So we're running a data center. So what we said to him was, so he was actually thinking about cloud before cloud was called cloud. So think about that in 2001. Well, the other part of that was we said, you know what we're really interested in? What software were you using to provision as fast as you were provisioning, given how you had to scale up and surge in order not to go down? So he told us, I said, would you sell that to us? So they started thinking about it, repackaged yeah. it, and that's Opsware that yeah. he ended up spinning off, selling out, but he was working on cloud. So now come fast forward to cloud. So Tony's talking about apps and all this other stuff. People are looking at it because of the argument. To me, there is the enablers. No, yeah, the, I'm at the point where like, you don't even need a data center anymore. We shouldn't be talking about data center consolidation. It should be data center closures. Each of your final parting thoughts on maintaining resiliency and the role of leadership in that. It takes leadership that can help create incentives for your team to think differently, to act differently, because it's not just enough to just think differently, and really encourage the risk takers to, to look outside the box and say, well, every day right now, it looks like things are being okay. What are the things that we're not thinking about that's on the future that may be a disruption like a 9-11 like event or maybe the disruption because the marketplace may change or our customer base might change we may have a disruption of that sort and that's where you really want to have people thinking differently i think if you want to have true resiliency it requires leadership and the adoption of disruptive technology and innovation because you can't have the resiliency without innovation. Because what everything David's talked about is innovation of thinking, which requires the leadership to allow it to be embraced in the organization. Our chairman is a courageous guy. When uh, we moved our, our data centers and we went offline, they tried to attack him on the hill. He said, I absolutely refuse to apologize because it's what had to be done and it's the right thing to do. Uh, there are pain points. I mean, there are pain points, but it has to happen and unplugging people is always unpleasant, but um, there are plenty of technologists out there to help. And I think there are plenty of people in government and elsewhere that have their heart and soul in making a change. I, you know, the incentive it should be the outcome. I don't think these pay things or anything like that will help. And um, I think what the government has to do in particular is not provide disincentives. Mm -hmm.